board for this event. And I th again, I think we'll have some people that are popping in tonight, but I wanted to say thank you all again for coming. My name is Amanda James. I'm from the Louisville Alumni Office. Um, and I am going to go ahead and hand it over to my wonderful colleague and friend, Nakia Strickland, to get us started. Hi, everyone. My name is Nakia Strickland, and I work alongside Amanda James in the alumni office. So I want to welcome you all to maintaining your mental health while fighting for social justice. Thank you for joining us for a panel discussion with Dr. Dorica Canada Cunningham, Deshara Dobb, and Dr. Stephen Niffley, moderated by Ashley Hazley. A question and answer session will follow this discussion, so please feel free to use the chat box to submit your questions. If you would like to ask anonymously, you can private message Amanda James or myself, Nakia Strickland. Before I introduce our moderator for the event, please be advised the dialogue presented here is meant as purely informational. It is not to be misconstrued as medical advice. Please contact your local mental health provider to engage in individualized treatment for any concerns that you may have. So our moderator tonight is Ashley Hazley. Ashley is a two-time alumna of the University of Louisville. Ashley currently serves as the Assistant Director for the Muhammad Ali Institute for Peace and Justice at the University of Louisville. She made her way back to the Cardinal family from Bellarmine University's Career Development Center, where she served as a career advisor. Prior to her time at Bellarmine, Ashley worked at the National Collegiate Athletic Association, NCAA, in the Education and Community Engagement Department. In addition to work-related activities, Ashley also co-teaches a graduate level course on multicultural issues at the University of Louisville and sits on the Alumni Association's Board of Directors. Ashley is also a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. A new venture for Ashley is to serve alongside people in Louisville Rapid Access Network, helping individuals who are facing evictions to get access to recourse. I will now turn it over to our moderator for the evening, Ashley Hazley. Well, hello. Thank you so much for that introduction, Nakia. Um, I'm so excited to join you all today. Um, briefly, before I start to introduce our wonderful panelists, I would just like to take a moment um, to acknowledge the, the collective pain that our city, that the, the United States, and quite frankly, the world is feeling right now. Um, and just to use this space as my own opinion to say um, that Breonna Taylor deserved better, um, David McAtee deserved better, and our brother in Jeffersonville, Malcolm Williams, um, also deserved better. Um, and that I know that we come together um, holding that. So, you know, I know that we're bringing that into this space and just to acknowledge that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, introduce our three panelists. Um, they've got some great words from you, I mean, for you, and I think they're really gonna pour into you this evening. Um, so first, we have Dr. Dorica Canada Cunningham, who is a licensed psychologist in the state of Massachusetts with 10 plus years um, of clinical training and practice. Dr. Cunningham has a diverse professional and clinical background, including providing psychotherapy, community outreach, assessment, and consultation for universities and schools across the state of Massachusetts. She's currently a staff psychologist and the Multicultural Specialist for Counseling and Health Services at Salem State University. She's also a visiting assistant professor for the psychology department and has served as an appointed member of the President's Advisory Committee on Diversity and Inclusive Excellence at Salem State University. Dr. Cunningham enjoys writing with adolescents and young adults, particularly with themes around race, culture, identity, and spirituality. She engages in her work from an empowerment and social justice perspective and is passionate about honoring and amplifying the voices of communities of color in the field of psychology. Additionally, she is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, an alumna of the Beta Epsilon chapter at the University of Louisville. Our next panelist is Deshara Dobb, um, who is a proud two-time UofL graduate with her Bachelor of Science in Communications with a minor in Pan-African Studies and a Master's of Science in Social Work with a specialization and couple and family therapy. She is the founder and CEO of Vision of Promise LLC, a culturally competent and trauma-informed counseling and consulting service headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky. 
Deshar serves as community advisor for the Kent School Restorative Solutions Community, I mean, committee, a support team member for the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Louisville, vice president of the Kent School Alumni Council, a member at large for the African American Alumni Council, and as a proud member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. And last but certainly not least is um, Dr. Stephen Niffley, Jr. Um, he is the Associate Director for the Center of Behavioral Health and an Assistant Professor in Spalding University School of Professional Psychology. Dr. Niffley's area of expertise is research and clinical work with Black males um, and the treatment of race-based stress and trauma. Dr. Niffley also serves as an organizational diversity consultant and works with law enforcement departments on addressing conflicts between communities of color and police officers. Dr. Niffley has written numerous books, book chapters and articles on black male mental health, black males in the criminal justice system and academic achievement. And so we've got three amazing panelists for you who bring a depth of knowledge from many, many different areas. Um, so I think just with our time, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the questions if that's okay with everyone. So for our first question, how do you balance and maintain momentum in doing justice work um, with your own rest and ensuring your own well-being? And that can be for anyone. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, I think that even just in, even just engaging in work is definitely um, an act of self-care and I think an act of the ability to be really be in an, your authentic self but um, I would say that the delicate balance is always being able to take an internal temperature of um, when you have had enough when you need to take your rest um, when it is time to um, maybe step away for a little bit I think a lot of times when you are in the midst of um, social justice work or social action work a lot of times you are completely in the thick of it and a lot of times your self-care gets on the back burner because you are very much about the work at hand. Um, and so one thing I would definitely say is um, carving out self-care time um, in the midst of that work. And I know that especially uh, with the time that we're in right now, what does that look like when you are not knowing from time to time when you would need to be present for things or when your services would need to be available. Um, but I would definitely say that um, definitely always make yourself a priority and making sure that you're always scheduling time, um, whether that is taking a nap, making sure that you're eating, if that's setting an alarm on your phone. Um, but most importantly, I would say definitely um, finding that support system and checking in with them um, because a lot of times you will never realize how much this work can really get to you um, until you are actually speaking out loud. And that's a lot of times when the emotions will come. Yeah, I, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, heard some feedback. Um, I first wanna thank uh, the Louisville Alumni Office for um, engaging us in this conversation and for inviting me to come speak on, in the, on this conversation. Um, I wanna just first say that I am so um, pleased and uh, filled with joy um, to be able to speak with people and see faces and names um, from the University of Louisville, um, people who I've been connected with before. Um, I also, uh, to um, Deshara's point, I, I want to acknowledge um, kind of the difficulty and pain um, and trauma and even the grief that can come along with doing the work um, and, and acknowledge kind of what individuals in the city of Louisville might be sitting with right now and those participants that are listening right now might be sitting with. And um, as we, as the pan panelists are coming to speak with you and kind of impart our wisdom um, and our experiences, I also just want to acknowledge that there are not any um, kind of quick fixes or there isn't really a magic bullet um, to kind of navigating healing through um, doing social justice work. And so um, as you all are listening, you might walk away with more questions than answers and that's okay. Um, and I just wanna encourage folks to give yourself grace and compassion for whatever your journey of healing through doing this work is. Um, and I think that is important to um, some of the balance of doing the work is having that compassion with yourself um, for how difficult it might be um, in doing the work. Um, I also, when I think about the question of balancing kind of the rest, and like Dashara said, the self-care, 
um, there's a quote that comes to mind for me. I post this quote everywhere. It's in my email signature. It's in my office. People on campus are probably tired of hearing about it at my university. Um, but Audrey Lord has a quote that says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It's self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. Um, so kind of just to add to what Jashara said, um, I believe that we have to center caring for ourselves and caring for each other as well in the work that we're doing. Um, it's not an appetizer, it's not a dessert, but it's a part of the main entree of, of social justice work. So really um, engaging in the work and making sure that caring for ourselves is a part of the work, seeing it as the weapon and the tools that we're using in order to preserve ourselves to do more work as well. Well, I really appreciate all of those uh, great responses uh, and answers. and. I'm always so humbled and grateful to see people that I've known for a really long time in the space. I didn't know we were going to be shouting out organizations, so I'm just going to make a quick shout out to Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated uh, since we're doing that. Um, the only things I think I want to add uh, are three things because the best things come in threes uh, is to be present, be aware, and be intentional. So be present with your family, be present with your friends and then be present with your experience, right? You know, many, many of us might feel the need to lean out of what is going on and what we're experiencing, uh, but the more you lean into it, uh, even if things feel tough in the beginning, uh, eventually uh, that pain will wash over you and you'll be able to push through it. Uh, be present, so be aware of your triggers uh, for, for anxiety, for trauma, uh, et cetera. Uh, be aware of your self-worth and resilience and be aware that you have control over certain things in, in your life and to be aware of what those things that you have control over. And the last piece is to be intentional. So be intentional in your self-care. I really appreciate the Audre Lorde quote. Uh, the other one that kind of comes to mind is that self-care is a revolutionary act. Uh, and so always just kind of keeping in mind that uh, taking care of yourself is revolutionary. Uh, and I know that's, that's what we're trying to do from a social justice standpoint. Uh, so be intentional in your self-care, be intentional in your connection and connecting to others, especially caring others, and be intentional in your compassion to yourself. So be present, be aware, and be intentional. Awesome. Thank you all so much um, for those really good points. A, a follow-up question to that. Um, I think you all, and Deshara, you specifically pointed it out, um, but Dorika and Steven, you definitely kind of um, continued on that conversation, but like checking in with yourself. Do you have any advice on like what that could look like, um, what it could look like to pause and check in um, so that you are in tune with how you're feeling? Yeah, I would um, say something that I think a lot of us you know, easily can struggle with is being in tune and aware of sensations in our body. Um, I am, I come from the belief that our body tells us a lot about what we're experiencing. It tells us a lot about when we're triggered, um, when we need to take a pause. Um, I can for sure uh, attest to the fact of sometimes our body will give up on us when we have pushed ourselves too far. And unfortunately, that's the moment when we say, oh, I need to take care of myself. Um, so I think if you can start to become more observant and be more mindful of your own body's reactions to the things that you encounter, um, if you can be more mindful, you will start to be able to catch things before it furthers along into something a, a little bit more extreme. Um, so for me, you know, I always joke about this, but I know when my eye starts twitching, I'm like, ooh, I'm getting to a level of stress. Um, that's kind of my first start. I can feel tension in my body. Um, I sometimes feel pains in certain places, headaches. Um, you know, I think in reality, a lot of us manifest experiences of anxiety, depression, trauma um, within our body, within our physical um, being. And so just being in tune with what that looks like for you and your body is one way um, to kind of be more aware of when you might need a pause or a break. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely add to that. Um, one of the terms that they use is like a body scan. So a lot of people, um, whether you are sitting in a chair, um, most of the time you uh, sitting or laying position is probably the best, but if you kind of close your eyes and just from top to bottom, 
kind of do a check with yourself. Um, as Dorica mentioned, we all know when we're not at even 95%, right? Like a lot of times we don't even know what 100% looks like at this point, right? But we know that maybe we can't function or we know we're not at our best. So I would definitely say, I think that that is an absolute daily necessity of really being able to check in with your body. Um, I think a lot of times when people are very active, we sometimes overlook when our body is telling us things because we're too busy or, or, oh, I get to it in a minute or, you know, I can be able to get over it. Um, but that headache thing, that that is a real, real thing, um, especially as seasons change. A lot of people, you know, kind of bypass it as, oh, maybe it's my sinuses or something that's not that serious. Um, but definitely do a complete check with yourself. A lot of us have these aches and pains that we've been having for a long time. And we're like, oh, that's just, you know, getting older or, you know, maybe I'm not being as active. But I think that that's also um, a sign of trauma as well. Um, when you're having these back pains, um, when you're not able to walk in the fluidity as you once were, um, definitely stomach pains, fatigue. If you're finding yourself in meetings, and I know a lot of us are maybe having technological fatigue at this point um, with being at home and being on the computer all the time, but if you're finding yourself kind of dozing off or you feel you've never felt rested, like you know that you went to sleep, but you're waking up still tired, or even throughout the day, you're still feeling like you're not catching all that energy, all those things are around just checking in with your body. So body scan is something that could be really important to just do a check-in with yourself daily to just make sure um, what are things that are going well. If things are not going right, absolutely attend to that immediately. Don't wait. Well, really great answers. Um, uh, probably the only thing I will add to that is that uh, when we do our check-ins, uh, there are three questions that we should be asking ourselves from a trauma processing perspective. The first one is, how are you feeling? How am I feeling? So when we experience trauma, especially as persons of color, what we might experience is something called alexithymia. What well, alexithymia essentially refers to is when we lose our inability uh, to process and communicate our emotions to others. And if we think about the lived experience of persons of color, talking about emotions, communicating our emotions is a significant part of our culture. And so when we lose that ability, we oftentimes lose a part of our culture as well. So ask yourself, how am I feeling? And push past the I'm fine, I'm okay, I'm doing all right, I'm good. Utilize those feeling words, right? So I'm anxious, I'm frustrated, I'm sad, I'm angry. Really lean into that. The next thing we should be asking ourselves what are our goals for the, for the day, for this time, for this experience that we're having? What are we hoping to accomplish? And the last question is, who will I lean on for support? Who can I go to that will help me out? Because one of the things that we oftentimes forget is that when we experience trauma, that we will feel alone, we will feel invalidated, we won't feel affirmed in our spaces, and being able to connect to those folks that can support us, that can validate us as authentic beings who are worthy of value and of love, uh, that will certainly go a long way. So ask yourself, how are you feeling? Remind yourself of what your goals are for, uh, for that day, for that experience. And then think about who can I lean on for support? Who will be there to help me out, recognizing that we all have to lean on someone at some time? Thank you so much for those words. I think um, it's really helpful to have kind of that, like those practical suggestions for checking in with ourselves because we can get so um, far caught up in everything else that we have to do that self can get forgotten. Kind of along the same lines of questions, um, if someone wanted to know when is it or is it ever okay to say that something is not worth your health? because that the system and the folks in charge won't change. Um, and so I'll just repeat it. When is it or is it ever okay to say something's not worth my health because the system and the folks in it will not change?
So I'll, I'll start here. I also just recognize that I have privilege in the space as a male. So I always just try to make sure my uh, female colleagues always go first, but I'll just kind of introduce a thought and I'm certainly that they will build upon it in the space. Uh, there's this term that we have in the diversity literature called emotional labor. And what emotional labor essentially refers to is the labor from an emotional standpoint that it takes as a person of color, as a marginalized individual to exist in certain spaces. And this labor comes from having to deal with microaggressions, having to uh, communicate one's experience ongoing, uh, or just having to deal with overt uh, acts of, of sexism, racism, you know, heterosexism, et cetera. And there's emotional labor involved in that. But what I always argue is that um, you always have a choice as a marginalized individual to determine how much emotional labor you're willing to endure in a space. So I would always offer up that you have the choice at any time to remove yourself from a situation where you feel like the labor outweighs the benefits when it comes to your own physical and mental health. I was just gonna um, quickly say, I agree with what uh, Dr. Niffley mentioned. Um, I think it's always okay um, to feel like you need to step away um, from a system um, when it doesn't feel healthy for you. Um, and sometimes that means disconnecting emotionally or mentally. Sometimes that means physically disconnecting or distancing yourself. Sometimes it means completely leaving the system and maybe coming back or leaving and never coming back. Um, I think you can always have, um, you know, to um, Dr. Niffley's point, that choice and that opportunity to do that. Um, and sometimes we do need to either temporary dis temporarily disconnect or distance ourselves um, from unhealthy um, systems, because if a system is depleting us of everything that we have to offer, we will have nothing to pour out. You know, an empty vessel and an empty cup does not have anything to pour from. And so um, realizing that sometimes we do have to remove ourselves to replenish, to retreat, to regroup, to restore ourselves. Um, and, and, and that might mean you're doing something in that time of, of disconnecting, or it might, like I said, mean that you are disconnecting completely. Um, and that is a hard choice to make. And I, I, I know that that can come, sometimes come along with some guilt and shame uh, of doing that. Um, but I do think that that is real because remaining in a system that you feel like is depleting you is probably not going to be best for you or for you know the work that you're wanting to do the only other thing i will add is i think that that question is something that all of us at some point in time have wrestled within ourselves of what is it worth for me staying in this system or why do i feel like i have to question if my health and safety whether it's physical emotional mental um, is worth whatever the task at hand is. Um, and I think that that is something as marginalized communities, we have unfortunately, and even generations prior to us, have had to just press through um, things that were unjust, that um, were um, maybe not even have a, a, a common goal with everyone that is within the system. A lot of people felt a sense of oppression. And I think that being able to stay in systems, as they mentioned, um, where you do not feel um, connected, you don't feel supported, um, you don't feel like they align with your overall goals, I think is absolutely um, necessary for you to step away. And I think that just that question alone, all of us have to really ponder if we ever get to that point of, um, why is this not a safe environment for me? And really evaluate that. Um, if this is a temporary thing, if it's something that you know, possibly could be fixed with, you know, some policy or conversation, you know, it might be worth exploring, you know, that might be an opportunity for you to be pushed um, or challenged in a way emotionally to maybe get you at that next level um, that you were ultimately, you know, chosen and destined to be in. But I think also uh, we must evaluate if things are really worth it um, and if it's gonna be something that's gonna be detrimental um, for an extended period of time or even permanently. I also want to um, speak to the reality that some people might feel that like I can't leave a system because I also think that can be true and real. Um, and so I think some of us might feel like I have to actually 
remain in this system. And I think when you feel like you have to remain in a system that feels difficult to navigate, um, some wisdom that was imparted on me from my advisor, um, Dr. Janet Helms, that I carry with me everywhere that I go, um, is she's told me when you're in a system, any system, even when it's not difficult, but especially if it's a difficult system to navigate, it's important that you have support from others on three different levels. So have support within your subsystem. So for example, I work in counseling and health services at Salem State. That would mean having a, a person I could go to in counseling services, have a person in the broader system. So that would mean having someone within Salem State University, but then also have someone outside of the system. So I have a colleague that I connect with who also works at a university counseling center in a similar role as me. Um, and we have conversations that are very supportive. Um, sometimes you can't have all three of those. And I think ideally having all three would be best. Um, but if you could at least have someone, even if it's outside of your system, that can help you um, heal and deal through whatever difficulties that are coming up, um, that might help you at least survive the system if you feel like you have to remain in it. Thank you. And kind of to that point, how do you find your people? Um, especially when the system is big, especially when you might be the only one, um, and even if you're not the only one, um, sometimes systems are so big for a purpose that like it's hard to even find them in maybe not that smaller one, but the broader one. So like, how do you find your people? Well, one, one thing that was very helpful for me, and I'll just kind of go back to my very beginnings of really discovering um, my love for social action and my need for um, engaging in community work, and that is um, finding small subsystems so that if that's within student organization, if that is within departments, if that's going within the community, if there's um, organizations that may be aligned with your personal uh, mission and vision, um, and so all of us um, very um, ironically on this panel are all a part of NPHC. And so I'm sure all of us have some type of connection of how um, that connected with us in terms of finding our people, whether it was the mission of the organization, whether it was the people that came through with us, people that were in the organization long before us, things of that nature. Um, but I think that it definitely, um, at least for me, went back to uh, what my, my goals and dreams were and what my values were. Um, and it took a while to do that. Not everybody that's even in um, these subgroups might be your people, you know, just because you all have um, a similar frame in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you might not connect with them on the level that um, was mentioned before in terms of, you know, the emotional health of being able to um, break down those walls and have those meaningful conversations that might not be professional all the time, you know, really being able to dig in. And so um, one of the ways that, again, I have found my people is um, definitely surveying organizations um, and groups that align with my personal belief system. And that also can be church for a lot of people or your spiritual practice. Um, but definitely finding people that align with your internal mission and vision. So I, I realize in saying this, uh, that this is a, a significant understatement and saying that the pandemic uh, that we're currently living in has been awful uh, for a lot of people. But one of the, the beautiful things that has um, arose out of the pandemic is a realization of how connected we can be to folks even far away, that our world is much smaller than perhaps we ever thought in terms of our ability to reach out to those folks of similar mindsets who could be thousands of miles away. And so as I think about that, that is a way for us to help connect to those folks that can support us, that can provide spaces for us to heal and to learn and to grow is realizing that uh, we have this electronic device uh, that has allowed us to see folks all over the world, all over the country who think the way that we do, who perhaps can offer um, supportive ways of affirming who we are and validating our experiences. And so that's something that we can also think about is that our reach doesn't have to be just as far as our initial gaze and arms can go, but our reach is as far as our computers can take us. Um, and so just kind of keeping that in mind to not limit yourself to just your surroundings, 
but also those spaces that exist in our virtual format as well. Yeah, and I'll um, just quickly say, um, I think that finding your people in reality can just take time. And I think sometimes you have to be patient with, patient with the process of that. Um, you have to know yourself. Um, I think some of us start with a lot of trust and then we take away trust when we feel like you know someone has you know wronged us some of us um, start with no trust and we build trust with time um, and so knowing what kind of person you are will help you understand how quickly or how much time it might take for you to like connect and trust people um, i also think it, it can take a lot of vulnerability and social risk because so sometimes um, it, it's a risk um, to kind of share your true experience of something um, especially depending on what the you know racial cultural demographics of the people are in the you know community or system that you're working with um, and so I just want to honor that it can take time um, to, to find your people um, and to, to have patience with yourself with with doing that awesome thank you um, the last question is kind of on this line of um, questions is how do you feel how do you disconnect when you need to without feeling guilty Um, for me, I think it kind of goes back to um, the previous point around really um, navigating if things are going to cause um, a concern for your emotional safety, your mental safety. Um, I think a lot of times um, with social media, that that is my biggest one, um, especially with everything that has been going on in the last six months, I'll probably even go extend a little further than that. Um, I think that it is absolutely healthy to disconnect from those type of meetings, particularly those that um, might have some negative spin on it. And I'm sure a lot of us um, know what those sites are. Um, and getting out the comment section is it, one that I was um, reminded of earlier, actually. So I think that that's something that is very key um, as well. Um, it is not, again, it's, it's not a, um, you don't have to sacrifice yourself. Um, by unplugging. Pl unplugging is a necessity when it comes to your self-care. Um, I think that because we're in, in a technological age, a lot of people feel like if I turn my phone off, I'm missing something or some, something's going to happen catastrophic and I'm going to miss it. Um, one thing that I had to remind myself during this pandemic is going back to the basics. Um, so think about our forefathers and foremothers didn't even have cell phones. Um, what were they doing with their home phone? And I remember a day, even with me growing up, that I had to take the handle off the, um, off the, you know, the whatever. I don't even know what these things are called anymore. <laughs> but taking it off the base, just so you won't hear the phone ring, right? I think that it is absolutely healthy to turn your phone on silent and flip it down. Because I think a lot of times we could turn on silent, but the light still flickers. And that causes a panic and an anxiety as well. Um, but I think that it is absolutely necessary and there should be absolutely no shame um, in disconnecting because it's something that is a necessity um, to ensure that you will always maintain your emotional and mental safety. Um, and a lot of times we don't consider that because we're always thinking about the physical piece. Um, but a lot of things that we read, we internalize those things and a lot of people act in accordance to the things that they read. Um, and they do. So that's just one of the things I, I would just keep in mind is definitely realizing that that's a part of your self-care. And to Dashara's point, um, I think there's a need to reframe. I, I love this question. Um, and I think there's a need to reframe it as you're not really disconnecting, you're actually connecting. It's just with yourself. <laughs> and so um, I think that's what I think the Audrey Lord quote represents for me, that you actually have to see resting and disconnecting, if you want to call it that, as a part of the work and a part of the movement. Um, I love, there's actually a movement right now um, about rest as resistance. Um, so actually seeing that as a part of your resistance, um, being able to rest. Um, there's a, a person by the name of Trisha Hers Hersey that talks about napping as resistance. Um, and she talks about how um, we kind of have this burnout culture that a lot of us adhere to, especially our generation, the millennial generation, 
generation and the generations um, you know to come after us um, have this almost like we we have a culture of of kind of like an ideal of martyrism um, that we don't actually have to adhere to and so um, as much as there's a lot that we can be doing I think some of this has to do with our values and our culture and how we're being um, and so I think even just changing how you think about it and say I'm actually not disconnecting I'm connecting um, I'm connecting to me and that will actually help me connect more to other people and connect more to the movement in the future well thank you all for such amazing points um, I will, we'll just kind of offer three additional things for us to consider in the space uh, when it comes to with that disconnect or as uh, Dr. Canada Cunningham is suggesting uh, connecting with yourself uh, is to talk about uh, intentionality, uh, to talk about working through guilt, and then also uh, having an accountability partner. So many of us will throw around the ideal of self-care and the ideal of disconnecting or connecting to oneself, but we'll talk about it as aspirational or inspirational in nature, as opposed to thinking about it from a practical standpoint. So self-care we usually think is going to the beach and laying out there and taking in some sun and doing all those things. But while that all sounds well and good, for many of us, that's not something we can have great access to. Uh, Cause well, you know, there isn't a whole lot of beaches in Kentucky, at least that I'm aware of. So we can't do that on it. But what we can do is we can take 30 seconds to look inward and take a deep breath. We can go outside and enjoy the fact that there is this nature that has been created uh, that is amazing and something that we are so grateful and humbled to be a part of. Uh, we can take joy in our children if we have them. We can take joy in our family. We can just do those things that give us a moment of joy and a moment of reflection so we can engage in a posture of gratitude about the things around us. But because we're also many of us in a helping profession or those folks that are attempting uh, to uplift those that are coming from marginalized statuses, there's like a guilt that we experience that if we disconnect or we you know are unable to uh, be around folks uh, that we're trying to support that we're all of a sudden doing something wrong but as, as was indicated before you can't give someone something that you're not first giving yourself so you're actually doing a disservice to the people that you care about by not for, by first not taking care of who you are and, and, and feeding yourself as well so that's why we got to work through the guilt and then the last piece is that, you know, while many of us talk a good game about intentionality, while many of us perhaps have worked through the guilt, we still need someone to hold us accountable to say, hey, did you do that thing that you said that you were going to do? Did you take that 30 seconds? Did you take that walk? Did you call that person that is a caring individual in your life? So you have someone that you have to hold yourself accountable to. So remember, intentionality, work through that guilt, and then also find those spaces, those individuals that can hold you accountable for making sure that you take care of yourself. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, especially I think in the comments, we got a lot of, um, of reactions from some of the things that you're saying. So I'm glad that the question and the answers are really resonating with folks. So to kind of switch up our um, conversation a little bit here, um, what, uh, oh, sorry, I just lost it. So, Hari, how do you manage your emotions um, when a client, someone, and it may be for us that don't have like that, um, like client therapist or client counselor dynamic. So like a client or someone that you are obligated um, to helping or your job um, makes a racist or sexist or homophobic comment, or maybe even a comment that just really goes against the core of who you are when it comes to social justice and social change. So I can, say, oh, go, no, go ahead, Steve. You, you got it, please. You got it. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, this is tough, especially I think it depends on the, the role that you have. I think as a counselor, you have a different type of responsibility than if it's like a friend or a family member that says this. So I'll speak to that because I think it can be a little bit more complicated. Um, for me, if something comes up in a moment and I am in a situation where it's like, it's my responsibility to be empathic, <laughs> which can be really hard. Um, first, 
I'm going to breathe. Um, and that sounds very simple, but I will say deep breathing is a gift to you. It is free and it works <laughs> in the moment. It can help to ground and center you so that you can respond versus react. Um, so that is something that I use consistently. Um, I also think for me, what helps me to respond um, versus react on top of breathing um, is understanding and really putting whatever the person is saying or doing or the reaction in the context of kind of that person's development and where they are with their awareness. And so um, for me, I use some models like racial identity development um, in order to help me understand where is this person at? And is there a way that I can see what they are saying as not an, a personal attack on me, but more so reflective of some context of their ignorance or unawareness or with a reflection of where they are development, developmentally with regards to their own racial identity and understanding of race. Um, and that some days helps me a little better than others um, some days you know how you feel is how you feel and I, and I am one to always validate emotions and so um, if, if that let that anger come up um, it might not need to come up in the moment with the person depending on again what the relationship and your role is um, but I think it's important also to have spaces where you can honor the anger and the rage and the reactions that are coming up for you as well um, so that's kind of a combination of things um, with how I would deal with that with a client as a counselor So I appreciate how thoughtful and reflective uh, your answer was, because uh, I think in the space that I'm in now, my tolerance is just a, a little bit lower. <laughs> uh, so I'm will offer up uh, what you should do. Um, so there in the literature are four areas of intervention for the experience of microaggressions. They're called micro interventions for microaggressions. Uh, the four are educating the offender making the invisible visible, disarming the microaggression, and seeking external support. And each one of those offers a space where one can advocate for themselves in a way that is authentic, while still making sure that you um, offer uh, a this isn't right uh, for how someone uh, has treated you. So disarming the microaggression, uh, educating the offender, seeking external support and making the invisible visible. Uh, those are all areas where we can provide support in regards to advocating for ourselves, but once again, remaining authentic to our experience, but still making sure that we have communicated to that person that what they said is not appropriate and has offended us in some sort of way. I knew their answers was gonna be powerful. That's why I just went ahead and just took a step on back. Um, the only other thing that I will mention is as mental health providers, practitioners, it is very important for us to know going into this work of what our levels of boundary is, right? So that's why it's very important for um, there to be an intake process um, for you to know specifically why somebody is coming in there. Um, I think a lot of times, and again, it will depend on um, your modality you're using or what is your therapeutic identity, um, but um, in the marriage and family therapy realm, you know, we do a lot of um, digging back. Uh, we call it genogramming. We, we unpack your history within your family, and a lot of times you will find out information from that. Um, I think that a lot of people, um, exactly what was mentioned before, speak in ignorance, and a lot of times I have found, especially as a clinician of color, when you are having someone that's a non-person of color coming to you, most times it's either they're knowing that they're gonna seek some type of insight that they've never experienced before. Um, there are times where there are individuals that are very familiar uh, with cultural differences and maybe want to engage in that in a more meaningful way, um, which also includes having those difficult conversations. Um, and so I will echo that absolutely. And I, my tolerance level is about this as well. <laughs> um, so I actually always um, put it back on the client and, and ask them to unpack that. You know, what is the reasoning for that? Where um, did this come from? Is this something that you grew up experiencing? Did you have a trauma? And is this why you're feeling the way you are? Um, a lot of times when people, um, have what we call very ignorant 
um, or non-basis comments, a lot of times hurt people hurt people, right? So they are basing it off of an experience in, in, in a lot of times that um, was not positive um, and that was traumatizing themselves. And I think that that is absolutely something that can be a, a, what we call a breakthrough uh, within the therapeutic process. And to echo Laura and, um, and Dr. Niffley, I do want to say um, you're right. Sometimes our tolerance is super low. Um, and I think it, it's also important to be aware of that and to proactively make maybe certain decisions about that. Um, there have been times when I have made certain decisions about like today. <laughs> today, I cleared the second half of my day um, because I needed that space. Um, so for those of you who are asking that question, who, who maybe aren't speaking specifically to like a counselor client dyad, um, sometimes we just have to know what spaces and what people and content we want to expose ourselves to. Um, and sometimes we do have the empowerment and the autonomy to say, I'm not going to engage in this conversation with this person because I already know this person might trigger and bring up some stuff for me and my tolerance is low. Not today, Satan. I just don't have it. Um, and so I think you have the right to make those decisions as well. A follow up question that I have. I love all y'all's answers. Um, we talked about it when it's like a, um, a client relationship or um, maybe just a folk that maybe just someone that you have to engage with from like an empathetic standpoint. But what about when it comes to our colleagues, um, especially when it comes to our higher ups and there's a power dynamic there? How do you manage your emotions through that? I'll just speak very briefly on this um, because I think all of us um, is probably in the midst of similar situations right now because a lot of systems are um, really speaking um, around social justice right now. Um, and many of those systems um, have had a history of oppressive um, systems and even possibly dealing with some oppression um, at this point. Um, one is I think that it is absolutely um, an opportunity at this moment um, for people to really speak um, within their experiences of what will be most impactful for the environments they're in. Um, and I frame it in that way um, because I think a lot of times when you speak from a personal level, especially to um, someone that is your superior, supervisor, um, it, it can definitely weigh, it, it, it can weigh some risk, right? But I think that if you frame it in the way of saying, you know, I believe that this is the concern of the system um, as a member of a marginalized population. You know, be very specific in the way that you are speaking of, you know, um, in my relationships um, with individuals in this system, this is the shared experience that we have. And this is why um, this is violent, why this is oppressive. You, I, I think it's very important for you to be able to speak because I think that that's also an act of freedom, an act of um, liberation and also revolution. Um, at the same time, and I think um, this was mentioned um, a little bit back, is there's always risk, especially when you're in an employment situation, because a lot of people fear retaliation. Um, and th so I think that even prior to um, deciding how you're going to um, address this concern, um, I think it is important for that person to, one, take a temperature check, make sure that they're good, make sure if this is something that is even willing to address. Um, because I'm sure that a lot of people are in systems where you can speak um, eloquently, you can really do the research, um, take all the time in the world to prepare, um, but you get there and it's in, in their tone deaf, right? Or, or they're like, okay, well, thank you for your recommendations and they're moving on. Um, so I think it's very important when you're always um, going against systems, and that goes for anyone, um, really take a temperature check of, of what are the things that are in my realm of possibility, um, speaking from an experience of being within that system and not personal, because a lot of times when you add the personal elements to it, a lot of times, I, in, at least in the experiences that I've had, um, it would get quickly shut down. Ashley, I for asking uh, this question, I think this is this can be super tough, especially when you're thinking about someone who has a power over relationship um, with you and who has the ability to maybe 
elicit some consequences that can really, really affect you. Um, I think this goes back to our conversation about finding your people, um, especially within your system. If you can have people that can support you around how do I, one, express my emotions and have a space to process my emotion and two, maybe figure out how to respond, that can be very helpful. Um, I also think that there is power in the collective. Um, and so I've been having some conversations with our department about um, let's not each stand alone and try to like dismantle or have these challenging conversations with our supervisor or the higher ups, the administration. How can we form a collective as a counseling center and say, we the counseling center stand on these values and wanna make these requests. I think there's power in that. Um, the last thing I will say is get a good therapist. Um, and this is coming from a licensed therapist who has her own therapist. Um, I come from the mind and the belief that healers need healing, helpers need help, and advocates need advocating. Um, and so I absolutely use my therapy space. I mean, my therapist is probably tired of hearing about some of the racial BS that I'm trying to process and work through. Um, but I think it can be incredibly important. Um, and I, for one, if anyone, any of the participants or folks that are listening to this need any support around doing that, I feel like those of us on the panel would be more than happy to support and give resources for how do you find a therapist that matches and works for you, um, because it can be incredibly helpful. Okay, and I'll, I'll be uh, extremely brief here. Um, so there's three things for us to think about. Expectations, perspective, and seeking affirming spaces. So expectations and perspective can go together because oftentimes when we go into spaces where we're attempting to talk with our, our higher ups, we have to think about the difference between a debate, a discussion, and a dialogue. And oftentimes when we are engaging with our higher ups, either we're seeking a debate or we're seeking a discussion. A debate is a lose-lose situation, a discussion is a neutral situation, and a dialogue is where folks are willing on either side to engage in a, a meaningful thought to where one might change. And so as someone that is seeking to talk with their employers, I would think about how can I foster a dialogue rather than get to a space where we're constantly debating with one another. And then the last piece is in finding those affirming spaces so sometimes your boss is just your boss. That person might not be a helpful person for you to be around. They might invalidate your experience. You might have to be your inauthentic self around them to navigate the space. And so where can you go to where you can be you and do you and feel affirmed in that space? So expectations, perspective, and then also remembering to find those affirming spaces. Awesome. Thank you all so, so much. Um, I see that we only have four minutes less um, in our call today. So I do would, I would love for us to give a virtual round of applause um, to our panelists and also just an, a, a huge thank you um, to Nakia and Amanda for bringing this together. In the last four minutes, um, I do want to acknowledge the fact that you all are doing the work. Um, you are handling um, and navigating your mental health while fighting for social justice. So if you could please in the chat, just drop some of the things that you're doing um, to kind of maintain your mental health. And um, then I'm gonna turn it over to Nikki. So as we wrap up, um, again, I want to thank our panelists and thank our moderator for sharing with us today on how we can maintain our mental health while fighting for social justice. And so if we can just give another virtual clap it up for them. Um, we really truly appreciate you all being here with us tonight to share your expertise, share your knowledge, share your thoughts, share your wisdom. Everyone in attendance will receive a follow-up email with a survey about this event as well as a recording of this event. Additionally, I would like to invite everyone to our upcoming diversity, equity, and inclusion virtual events. So on September the 30th, we will host Safe Zone Training with Aaron Weathers. And on October the 8th, we will host Intersexuality Bridging the Gap with Demetria Miles McDonald. And so those links will be in the chat. So I encourage you all to click on those for more information as well. 
um, and just to register for those two events. So again, thank you all for attending and I hope y'all have a great evening. I'm gonna mention one more thing. Um, our panelists today did share a number of resources with us and I sent that PDF in the chat too. So feel free to download that or we will also include that in the follow-up email. Thank you all. I saw some, somebody mentioned yoga in the chat and disconnecting from social media, which are two of my big things too. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank um, you. And please take care of yourselves.